So, everybody, um, ladies and gentlemen, it's my enormous pleasure to uh, welcome Fenella Fielding uh, to Lambda today. Fenella is a doyen of the British stage and has also had a, a major film <laughs> career as well. And we're very fortunate to have her because the tradition of humour and wit we're specifically studying, um, you know, uh, Fenella is a, a past master of. Can I just throw a few ideas at you to start with? What do you think differentiates our tradition of satire from the European tradition? What is it that makes Congreve, uh, Witchley, Bambra, and then going on to Goldsmith and Shiv, what does it make them uniquely British, do you think? Well, I should think the fact that uh, they, are, they are British. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Because, I mean, at one time, it wasn't that easy to cross from England to Europe. What, what, or what do you think it is about Britishness, maybe, that leads this sort of comedy, which is, you know, characterised by clever dialogue, verbal fencing, and a little bit of sort of rather sophisticated, gentle smut underneath? Oh, you know, underneath. Underneath. <laughs> <laughs> You've been in Sheridan. You've played Sheridan the Rivals. What... What makes that uh, play stand out for you? What makes it stand out is that I know when we did it that um, people poured in to see it. There had been a very, um, what's the word, august uh, revival of it at the Haymarket Theatre, which apparently was very boring. I don't know how it could be made boring, but they achieved it. <laughs> and um, our production was extremely jolly mm. because it's written very conversationally. I mean, there is some stylish twirling, but um, it's basically how people talk to each other. Yes. It's speakable dialogue and wonderful plot. The plot in The Rivals is unparalleled. One thing leads to another, and that alone makes it funny. Yes. And the, the characters are amusing in themselves yes. without necessarily being grotesque, yes. which is wonderful. Yes. Whereas I, I had a quick look at... Um, What's that Congreve that's so fantastic? Where the world? Where the world? Yes. Yes. Where the world? And there, all the characters who are mainly men speak as if they were the young inhabitants, all very friendly, of uh, an English university. <laughs> which is wonderful. Yes. I mean, I love witty young men and witty older men, of course. <laughs> but um, witty young men are more thrilling than anything else, I would say. Moving from Sheridan to Wilde, would you say that Sheridan is the clear uh, inspiration and uh, ancestor, if you like, to Wildean comedy? I suppose so, yes. because he came first, yes. but I don't really see much... You don't see a... No, I don't see a huge connection, because, I mean, you could... If you tore all the lines of Wild up into little strips, and each one was a, a, an epigrammatic yes. sentence, I mean, you know, you could uh, put it together in any formation that you picked it up. Yes. And the... The whole thing doesn't seem to be as important as the glitter of the individual line. You mean in Wild? Yeah. Yes. Well, it's not really true, I suppose, because the importance has the best plot, practically, well, it, of anything. Of, of any comedy, I've ever absolutely. Come it is. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's but a, then Sheridan has wonderful plots. Yes, absolutely. And that's what makes his plays easier, easier to play, 
and uh, easier to go to uh, well, than Congreve. Well, let's talk about specifically Sheridan, and you played uh, Mrs. Malaprop and Lydia Language. Okay. Mrs. Malaprop is uh, one of the important characters in what's it called? What's the Rivals. The Rivals. Um, she has a niece who has a romance with uh, a wonderful soldier, but she's forbidden to see him because this woman and the, the young man's father have their own plans for the husband and wifery of their son and daughter. She is very proud of herself for knowing a great many difficult words in the English language. <laughs> and um, she shows off with them, but she usually gets them wrong. <laughs> and so that's why there's a, a word in the English language, in the dictionary, a malapropism. A friend of mine says, when she's talking about a little vignette in the film, she's Oh, there was a wonderful vinaigrette in the film. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That, that, that's a that's malaprop, exactly isn't it? what um, it, she uh, is full of those, and the audience go pop. Sure. Well, Lydia has very romantic, and you know, reads a lot of novels that are romantic, and um, like many young, just the same as her lover. She doesn't want to be instructed on who she's going to fall in love with or marry, and neither does he. No. So, uh, Mrs. Malaprop is her guardian yes. or her aunt, I can't remember which, can't doesn't remember. matter. Oh, Same you. thing. <laughs> um, she wants her, her, her niece to marry who, who she thinks is suitable and Lydia's amour, yes. his, her, his father wants the same. Yes. And what neither of them realise, that the, men, the man that Lydia is in love with and the girl, <laughs> and the girl that uh, the young man is in love with, are the very same as their parents want them mm -hmm. to be, to marry, yeah. but they don't realize that. So that uh, when Lydia's aunt, Mrs. Malaprop, says, you know, you're to forget this idea of your gorgeous Beverly, who, who the hell he is, uh, and you've got to marry what I tell you to marry. Yeah. And the same is happening to him yes. and so forth. So it makes a lovely plot with uh, the father <coughs> and the aunt pushing them together without realising that that's the very thing that they want themselves. Yes, Witchley uh, is a little bit smuttier, isn't he, oh, than, than the others? Rude. Yeah. And that is, uh, Horner is, I think there's quite a lot of uh, uh, there's, there's quite a lot of vulgarity in that. I think yes, I saw that. Is. I think when I was about thirteen, I was bowled over for how punchy it was. Even now, you know, in fact. Yes, really. Nowadays, the audience somehow still don't like it. No. What distinguishes Wilde from his predecessors? I suppose what distinguishes him is the this endless row of totally brilliant quotable lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could actually get people to come on stage one after another without any plot and say the, these lines one after another and the audience, not even knowing the situation they belong to, mm. would find them funny. And they're funny now, not just funny at the time. No. And their wording doesn't make them awkward for modern ears Not either. Mm -hmm. Let, let's move on to Coward. Um, uh, what Coward have you done? Um, Fallen Angels. Fallen Angels. Yeah. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Um, yes. It's extraordinary. Um, when we started rehearsing it, 
we found lots of the lines very awkward and uh, then we sort of had a look at each other's copies and we were both working from an American production that had kind of rewritten it and where Coward had brilliantly you know when you have four short lines one after the other and it's funny like that they've altered it into two long lines instead of four short lines which took all the humour away completely mm. because all the rhythm was lost and <laughs> you thought well, how could they do that why bother to do it I mean awful for us to have to use that copy in the end we ditched it and went and got the original <laughs> yes Coward uh, can't improve on well, but it's he has a he ha it's that uh, very succinct way of summing something up in a tiny little aperçu that yeah. is usually very funny. Um, what coward? Yes, coward. I Absolutely, mean, you know, yeah. totally. So what do you? Th because uh, my lovely students here are, are mainly from North America. Well, all, uh, apart from my Mexican friend, um, and. We've been looking at various of these authors and the, it, whether it translates into American culture. Um, it's, it's usually a question of accent. The moment you've got a lot of actors talking in an English accent in an American environment, mm. it, it sort of sets up little barriers immediately mm. because you've got to think, Oh, it sounded like this. Oh, yes, I know. In in in, in America, we say such and such, mm. and that makes little delays all the way on, on every line, so it never gets going. So that is why then, in Fallen Angels, in this copy that you'd got, presumably, they'd rewritten it for the American ear. Yeah, that's right. And you were doing this in America. No, we were doing it in England. Doing it here. So you had but that was what was so ridiculous. <laughs> well, we just finally just chucked it out yes. and used the English, the original. It was so stupid. Yes. It was an accident, you know. Got to be generous. Well, the, the coward, of course, uh, had enjoyed a huge uh, success in the state, didn't he? Mm. Yes, absolutely. Now, last week we all had uh, a look at a look at the autumn. <laughs> A um, lovely nodding smile. We were. <laughs> we read a bit first, and then we had a had a look at it the, with that lovely production with Beryl Reed and Harry Andrews. Um, what and, was it called? And uh, entertaining Mr. Sloan. Oh yes, yes, yes. yes. Uh, and uh, that you really quite enjoyed that. For those of you yeah. who could hear it. <laughs> um, how do you think Autumn? Because he does fit in with this. Um, this comedy, his lines are very clever and they definitely have that sort of succinct sense of summing up a, a whole world with just a, a, a phrase. Well, he kind of modelled himself, didn't he, on um, Oscar Wilde? Yes. yes. <laughs> you know when um, uh, uh, Entertainment Slow first came out at the Royal Court, wasn't it? I think yeah. in uh, 1965. And it caused a huge moral outrage, didn't it? <coughs> yes. Yes. Yes, it did. Why? I, well, I think because. <laughs> 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 I, I think because. Um, you know, but we still had censorship up until I think. Ah, oh, that wasn't it? was the play that um, Maximilian Schell was in. Oh right. Yes. What was it called? Yes, a Patriot for Me. That's it. And there was still a Lord Chamberlain then that everyone had to send their scripts to before you could perform them. And he put blue pencils through all sorts of things. I remember, in fact, when we were doing Valmouth, as was still the thing, um, the script was sent to the Chamberlain first. And he blue penciled some absolutely innocuous things <laughs> and rewrote for our benefit lines that he thought were a little tricky 
in the most terrible plonking way. You could never have spoken the lines, no. and he'd got it all wrong anyway. Well, when it got to Patriot for me, he got the script and he blue penciled virtually everything, even the title, I should think. <laughs> and um, they thought, well, what are we going to do? I know what we'll do. We will change the Royal Court into a theatre club. Yeah. And nobody can come and see this play unless they are a member. And they only charged five shillings to become a member. It's 30p. And um, so <laughs> no, it just meant everybody went and everybody saw it. It was yeah. wonderful. Well, that is extra. I mean, that is almost like a Monty Python sketch. So the Lord Chamberlain, who was not a man of the theatre in any sense, takes it upon himself to rewrite. <laughs> A professional writer's script, yeah. you know, in the, in the thought that it will improve it. Yes, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Have you heard of Ronald Furbank? No. He's a, a late Victorian Edwardian writer, isn't he? With yeah. a, quite a camp theatrical eye for the, the surrealness of life. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about Balmuth? When I was asked to be in it, I had no idea what Balmuth meant mm. or was if it was a thing or a place, it was a place. And um, I've never heard of the author. And I found that it was mainly my gay friends who knew it. And um, that's all I can tell you about Right. <laughs> <laughs> I think that says everything we need to know. Um, you know, we, we don't really have time to fully do you justice. <laughs> You know, this is, a, this is a quick sort of in and, in and out with Fenella. Um, but uh, the modern day, where has this tradition gone? Where does Alan Akeborn, do you think, where does he fit into all of this? Well, he's so extraordinarily wonderful yeah. that uh, I don't see it as a con uh, something continuous. It's not a continuous, it's his own thing. A, a tradition. I mean, it became immediately. Yes itself, didn't yes. it? And, um, I mean, he, it, what was wonderful about Aikborn is that he appeared to write about everyday stuff, but in such an individual way. Yes. And actors love playing Aikborn. Well, it is, it is hilarious. It's it's, it is terribly yeah. funny. Uh, so, just as we're moving into the last part, um, our wonderful guys here have been developing as we've been going along, which we'll, in the next two sessions we're going to look at, have been developing a little piece that they're going to do that uh, hopefully, not hopefully, but will <laughs> skewer the tradition that we're looking at. Have you got any pointers? If they're going to, if they're going to write uh, or come up with a little piece, and having looked at Wild Norton Coward and Sheridan and Congreve, what tips do you think you could give them for bringing this, because, because they're American, and this tradition doesn't really exist in the States. Okay. It does with Frazier, of course. Yes. You oh. know, which really is totally part of this. The best thing ever. Isn't it? Well, <laughs> it, is, it, is, it, is, it is. That's where it lies. It lies over the pond now in Seattle. Um, but can you give our, our wonderful um, uh, chaps a little... What, what would you say if you were going to put together a piece like this? What would you say are the ingredients for a recipe of comedy of manners? Um, well, I suppose it's got to be characters whose characteristics are not hackneyed but are immediately recognisable mm. in the most exciting and delightful way. Mm. Where everybody thinks, oh, good, oh, I, I can't... <laughs> I mean, when it's new, they think, oh, should I be laughing at this? <laughs> and then when it's OK <laughs> to laugh, yes. they fall about. They it's just wonderful. Yes. When you were in the States, if it was this type of comedy that you were performing and what your experience was while you were over there in New York? Yes, I went over first to 
to an American university. It's the one where it's all women, where the Mrs. women Strata? turn against the men. Mrs. Strata? Yes, absolutely, yes. Oh. Yes, that's what we did. Yeah, that's what I played. And they asked me to do it instead of somebody, well, I mean, you know, instead of uh, an American girl. I don't know why. I think they thought somehow, because it was a classic, that somebody English would know how to do it better. <laughs> but a fat lot they knew. <laughs> I don't know. I did my best. It's a smashing play. <laughs> This is the equestrian, the, the one of my favourite ever memories is Vanilla saying in Carry On, screaming, do you mind if I smoke? <laughs> and then starting to emanate smoke. <laughs> oh, <laughs> it is, it is. Things that has made me, uh, to this day, makes me howl with laughter just thinking about it. Oh, it is. <laughs> and I saw you in Hedda Gardner as well, so I've seen, you know, the breath. Well, that's but the. I'm just going to say <laughs> that what's very interesting is that all the, almost all the playwrights, and I don't know if this makes that you talked about, uh, were Irish. Um, with the except until we get to Calvert. So I'm not sure about Witchley, but all the other ones, you know, Congre um the uh, and Sheridan and Wilde and Shaw, obviously, <coughs> we actually get and Goldsmith. They're all Irish. Well, it, it, I, this is did something we talked name. about. You've actually spoken about which is the outsider. You are not fully allowed into, into uh, English so society. about the rhythm of Irish language, I think. And, and I had a friend who used to say, say that Restoration comedy was best done in a Deep South accent. And if you try it out in a Deep South accent, you'll find, you find a, 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 you know, that kind of love, you know, sort of, and all of that. that <laughs> very like sort of our image of, of what it was like, like Gone with the Wind. Yes. You know, sort of, um, that sort of society. And, and I think the other thing that you were talking about was, which I think is what you were so brilliant about, in like in Carry On Screening, were things like the repression. You know, so the sexual codes and the sexual yeah. repression, which then, of course, is what's under all the, sort of the, the gay radio, radio comedy, yes. and then things like Carry On, carry on films, which yes. are all nudge, nudge. But much better than nudge, nudge, because they're underneath... Well, I think they're very undervalued, and I think that, that, that posterity will will value them uh, uh, for, for, for the for the moment of genius that they actually really are in fact there's something about the playing with language or playing with uh, what what you said about sort of the character they're all named aren't they like language you know so you're, you're given this language or what can you do about language yes. and they are, you know malaprop she's malapropo all yeah. the time yeah and anthony absolute you know so you've actually got these figures who are named. Well, the it's name unique. tells you the character, yes. yes. And, and it's sort of fact that's sort of part of what you're also talking about, the things that like carry on screening, you, you have a genre, and that it seems to me, I, if I understood you, what you're saying when you say that it's sort of there, and we all know, and then we watch them act out in a way that is different or surprising. Yes. And so you're expecting the languishing heroine, who suddenly does sort of she languishes, but then she takes choices which are not what a languishing heroine should do. Or yeah. Something. I, I was wondering whether that's what you were. Thinking. Sort of, yes. Yes. It's, uh, it's characters that you can feel for, isn't it? You've got to be able to see the point. Um, otherwise, they're not marvellous characters. But even in Wilde, Ernest does a name, it's a play on the name, so it continues that tradition. Uh, and when we were looking uh, at Coward, um, what's the surname of Chase? Chase. And that's what they do, they're always chasing, they're chasing each other, chasing their own tails. So even though it doesn't register that Coward is making an allusion to this is the tradition that we belong in, it is. Um, any other questions, please? I've got a few questions. Are we all right? Yes. Well, I suppose we're in restoration comedy, uh, we're doing love for love. And when you have these characters that are so defined by a singular characteristic, what do you think is um, a way to avoid leaning too much into that characteristic so that they come? I, I, my fear is about making something that's kind of grotesquely. I know what you mean. Yeah. Give me an example of a character with a name like that. Well, I'm playing Foresight. 
Mm -hmm. is, you know, obviously mm -hmm. kind of new wave spirituality, like this guy who thinks that he knows the future when he doesn't. And so I think it'd be easy to fall into a way of playing and that's very grotesque, but if you want to give the character dimension, I'm wondering. How is it spelt foresight? <coughs> in in the script. And that's love for love. <laughs> I haven't got the slightest idea. Um, does she behave like her name? Does she display foresight? Well, uh, if she doesn't, it means nothing. Okay. You just play it for what it contains. That's actually very helpful. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> very happy to pass it off. <laughs> I, I'm not very keen on, you know, plays with there's Mr. Wisdom mm -hmm. and Mr. Folly and Lord can't help laughing at him. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> So I just wanted to know what, what you think is funny. What I find funny, I do find Frasier terribly funny. I have a friend who's sick, to, sick, very ill, has to stay in bed a lot. And he wakes up in the morning and switches on the television to watch Frasier, and it helps him get through the day, yes. which is wonderful, that's isn't wonderful. it? I mean, that's not what Frasier is there for, <laughs> but it, nevertheless, no, it's know. marvelous that it works. Um, I don't know. What contemporary writers, what you know, do you think have got have got it, comedy-wise? Well, Alan Aikborn. I mean, the marvellous thing about his characters is they are shriekingly funny, but they're also heart-rending. Yes. I mean, it makes you cry. Yes. And uh, stuff like that. Yes. There's, there's sort of... There's lovely characters <coughs> in all sorts of... Like the Chronicles of Clovis. What was the author of... Uh, I've never come across Sarki. Oh, right, okay. Yeah. Hector Hugo Munro. Yes, that's Yes, it. that's right. Wonderful <coughs> characters in that. And, you know, not all a riot or, you know, four square out and out funny yeah. sort of thing, but delicate and sophisticated. Um, anything else? Any further thoughts? Anything you want to share with the, with the class today, Fenella? <laughs> or just out of the just blue. Just out of the blue. Just off the top of the No, I just ask me questions. It's much. Um, so when you go from doing this style of comedy into something like Hedda Gabler, do you find you're able to use the same tools, or is it a totally different process? I'm not quite sure what you said. Um, how one goes. How does your process differ whether you're doing something like Coward or Condry versus something more serious like Hedda Gabler? How does one approach it? Yeah, how do you approach yeah. it? Yeah, well, I should say that uh, Hedda, say, um, when you think about her, she, the, the beginning of the play, she's just come back from a really ghastly, unenjoyable honeymoon cruise with this man that she's married who isn't up to her, really. And quite clearly, she married him because there he was, a decent man, quite educated, <coughs> um, and sort of, she was the age where she would be become ridiculous if she were not married. And so she married him. And at the very beginning, she's feeling all the ghastliness of what she's let herself in for. And it's going on for life, she thinks. And um, her husband is a very decent man, not the brightest candle that <laughs> exists. And... Uh, 
Anyway, she comes in sort of inside. She's absolutely burning up with the horror of what she'd done. And there's only one character in the play that she can really relate to, and that's the naughty fellow. Um, Judge Brack. She, yes, yeah, she can chat with Judge Brack, and he respects her, but he knows all about her, and he, you know, <coughs> he knows how to put her down when she needs putting down, and. Um, it's a tragedy from start to finish, really. But she's terribly funny. And uh, it's tragic, really, except she's such a calm. <laughs> <laughs> when you're doing something like a comedy of manners, you know, are you using very different tools to when you're doing, you know, a, a major um, a straight part like, like Hedda? Um, of course, it's different, but... Uh, only different because the characters are different. Um, you've, it's just you've got to think of the age of the character, the neighbourhood of the character, the relatives of the character, the, the what's the word for mores? The way well, the, the ethics and morals. Yes, yeah, sort of. You know, what is... Customs. The customs and, um, yes, the law-abidingness, law the sense of humour, the attitude to education that exists at that period and so forth. How women rank. She ranks very high in her neighbourhood and... Um, Yet she's terribly unhappy because she hasn't got what she wants. And what she really wants is that drunken love Borg who is so unsuitable because of his drunkenness, although he has sort of reformed. But it was too late and so <laughs> forth. And it's, when you think about it in that way, it's terribly real. And it's kind of heart-rending. And at the same time, she does say some very funny things. But she isn't a riot. But I'm glad you did. <laughs>